Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Christy Wallace and Maricela Herrera. Hello and welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is your host, Christy Wallace, with my co-host, Maricela Herrera. Hi, Maricela. How are you doing on this lovely day? Hi, Christy. Doing okay. Doing well. It is, uh, it's quite nice in the Northeast, which I'm excited about. And I'm also excited after this, Maricela, you and I are uh, heading to a virtual meeting for the Girl Scouts of Greater New York. We're both advisors to that great organization. So I, I get to spend my evening with you as well. Yeah, I'm excited. It's always good to uh, check in with uh, the advisory board and get to see everyone, even if it's virtual. Yes. Well, I, you know, I, we've talked about this. I enjoy virtual. I think uh, it makes it much more accessible for me. And um, I still feel like I'm, you know, making connections, which matter. I agree. And, and we're doing some good work with the Girl Scouts. We're excited about, you know, how they've been supporting girls pre pandemic, but certainly during this time. And that has a lot to do with our guest today. So, Maria Idol is the chair and founder of the Nike Foundation. Uh, but she also has important work with the Girl Effect, uh, where she is the founder and chair as well. And and the Girl Effect is really, you know, aimed at supporting girls uh, in their education, in their well-being, um, particularly adolescent girls in developing countries. She and I had a powerful conversation about the intersection of of business and social responsibility, and the ways that we as leaders can step up and do more. And I just was blown away by the conversation. Maria is incredibly inspirational. And as we head into our Girl Scouts meeting tonight, Maricel, I'm thinking back on uh, my conversation with Maria and just how each of us throughout our lives can do more to support future generations. Looking forward to hearing that. And it's so true. We really can and should do more. You know, you know what we always say at Elevate, Anything is possible when you invest in women and girls. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to my conversation with Maria. Maria, I know you have so much to share, but I would love it if you could tell our audience a little bit more about you and about how you got to where you are today. Sure, I'd love to. Well, I was a student who was not the straight A student, let's just say. I, In school, I worked really, really hard and, and I graduated having no idea what I wanted to do. So my career path felt very unguided in the beginning. I wasn't sure. I started working as a reporter and I loved it, but then I ended up in government, working at the White House, then from there, working in the private sector at Microsoft in Europe, and then from there, <laughs> Nike. And the trajectory today looks really clear and a resume that makes sense. But as it was happening, it sure didn't feel that way. It felt like a very meandering journey of following the next thing that came in front of me, staying true to the things I was passionate about, but whenever I talk to a young person who wants to know about my career path, I'm always wanting to make sure they know that I also felt that I didn't know where I was going or wasn't sure I was making the right job choice and at the moment, and that you have to sort of step with courage each time um, and know that it will all make sense as time goes on and really be in it and enjoy each job as you're there and use the network that you have that will grow over time to make sure you get closer and closer always to the thing you're most passionate about. I couldn't agree more. I, I mentor a number of professionals, and that's oftentimes what I hear is, you know, that that stress of where am I going? What's next? You know, how do I forge my, my path? And I, I think it's hard to feel like you're not in control of it and to like lean into that journey. Were you ever uh, in that mindset where you were worried about what was next, or did you find the the skills and the tools to kind of you know understand that you know it's not necessarily a straight line and it's about where you you know where you end up? Yeah, it's interesting. I I, I was doing an interview and someone said, "Well, you've jumped around around a lot in your career," 
And, you know, today everybody jumps around a lot more. And I remember feeling really insecure about it and trying to be kind of apologetic or justify the moves that I had made. But I had really followed passions each time or a conversation led to another conversation, which led to me hearing about an opportunity. And, and so in the moments of panic, we know that feeling in our stomach when we go, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not good enough. Oh, I won't get this job or I have no path or my parents have asked me about this and I don't know what I'm doing or friend that in those moments is a moment to just take a deep breath um, and think about what you have, not what you don't have and figure out how to work toward the thing that is in front of you. That's one more step in front of you, one more step, as opposed to the big leap that you're thinking one day I want to be this. Well, that that's just disheartening that that's discouraging. And I think people ask you questions like when you're choosing which university to go to or what job to take, and you are expected to have these beautiful answers, but life doesn't come in beautiful packages all the time. It usually comes in very messy ones. Maria, thank you so much for saying that because it, I, it's important that we keep you know, reiterating that life does come in messy packages and that's okay, you know, and, and, and that's absolutely okay. When you uh, started at Nike, and, and I would love to talk a little bit more about this because it's a personal passion of mine, which is, you know, my understanding is Nike brought you on um, initially back in the mid 1990s as a way to really look at aspects of their business, particularly around uh, the supply chain and labor. And it had come out, there were definitely areas uh, to address and areas for improvement. And I say it's a personal passion because, you know, seeing how companies are creating progress, are taking action is important. We wanna see that companies lead with values, but, you know, when you came on, there was no real framework for that. So what was that moment like for you in, um, you know, joining Nike and then how, you know, just, I'm sure that was a big weight on your shoulders of all of the work to be done. And how did you figure out those next steps and what those priorities were? Yeah, I'm the daughter of an entrepreneur. My dad is a small business um, man. And so I grew up around a person who was constantly having to innovate and come up with a plan and pivot when things didn't work out <laughs> or when things worked out really well. And there was a lot of ups and downs as happens with every entrepreneur. So I think I developed a resilience as a young person watching my dad and doing projects alongside him. And I think we're all formed by those early experiences. So it's another point to how when you don't feel equipped for things, you have to think about things about your life that equipped you to take on different challenges. So I'm always drawn to sort of impossible challenges or big challenges or uncharted territory. It's what, what gets me excited and it can be incredibly difficult, but it motivates me to find what's the root cause of whatever problem that we're trying to solve. And then going at that with like, with an incredible passion and vigor. So you know, when we started the Nike Foundation, for instance, you know, we could have focused on anything, literally anything in the world. And when I talked with the founder of the company and I said, you know, what should we, what do you want to focus on? And he said, do the right thing. And so I looked at the world and what was really clear is half the world's uh, population, women were not fully participating in their economies, political systems and societies. And so that seemed very obvious, focus on women. But then I thought, gosh, you know, before you're a woman, you're a girl. And if you don't make it through adolescence effectively, successfully, your chances of being a woman who's able to fulfill her potential are really, really low. So I kept taking off a layer and then came to this thought, well, what about focusing on adolescent girls with the Nike Foundation? What about really looking at that transition of adolescence where human beings, whether they're whatever um, gender, they go through this massive moment of transition. And, and if you could get that right, so many things get right. So I think that the way to take things on is to usually pause to look around and figure out what's the sight line to success for what you're taking on, whether it was my early days at Nike or my early days at Microsoft or my early days in the White House. Each time I've walked into an office, I remember um, walking into my office in Microsoft in Europe 
like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? There's the beginning of things is so intimidating and you look for things to hold on to. And ironically, the thing to do is not to look for what to hold on to. It's to look to what's out there. So for instance, if you're going to try to get from Seattle to Hong Kong or, um, Paris to Istanbul, you don't just sort of start going to Istanbul. You you don't just get moving. You you say, well, okay, how will I get there? What do I what am I going to need? What resources? What's going to be at that destination? Is it really where I want to go for all the work I'm going to put into getting there? So in creating the Nike Foundation and creating the Girl Effect, it became a very simple compass, which is reach girls, get them on the global agenda, get massive resources going to girls in the world. And, and, and that compass then drove all efforts to get to that destination. And it meant that the organization and the way we worked over the years changed enormously over time. It doesn't mean that you're stuck on a destination and you don't move all over the place. It just means that you pull that compass back out of your pocket and you say, are we really Are we totally focused on getting girls what they need to succeed? Are we focusing or have we found out why we aren't on track right now? There's times when we weren't, we weren't getting what we wanted to get. It wasn't happening. We were focusing just on education for girls and realized that if you didn't focus on education and reproductive health and safety and voice and rights, that that girls needed more than just one thing. They needed multiple things to, to succeed because we all got multiple things to succeed. You just didn't go to school. You were also safe when you were there. You were able to study and do your homework and not burdened with chores. So the the taking on of challenges requires a finding of a, a, a compass to a destination and then the flexibility and, and the commitment to get there, um, but not a dogged commitment, but a flexible commitment to get to that destination. And then you can breathe and then you see, oh, okay, this step feels like it's it's connected. And the next step feels connected where you get confused as if your steps don't feel connected. So connected steps lead to good destinations. I am curious how you stay connected. During you know this time, this past year, for example, I lead a community of women in the workplace and my own experience is very different than the many in our Mm. And for me to best advocate for them, it's about understanding where they are. And how are you staying connected to, to this mission and to these girls? Well, I think the first thing is to stay connected to yourself. And I know this sounds completely so basic, but eat, sleep and exercise. And I've learned the lesson the hard way when I cheat on one of those three things I don't just cheat myself, I cheat cheat my family and I cheat the people I work with. And we have a first responsibility to be good to ourselves because if we're not good to ourselves, it's hard to be good to others. And I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but I really mean it. Like sleep matters, it's important. Read why we sleep if you don't think so. Eating healthily and eating in in consistent way that's good for your body. And, And then exercising to keep yourself moving, particularly in COVID. When, when COVID hit, um, there were so many things that, that we all lost. And, and I just remember this moment where I hadn't been exercising as much and I'd been kind of eating irregularly and my sleep was much. And I was just like, wait a second, pull it together, do those three things and do them well. And then support others doing those things well in your team and in your family and encourage, not with judgment, not with holier than nowness about how you're doing it so well and gosh, they really should get out there and <laughs> Get, get exercising or um, telling someone who's having trouble sleeping they should sleep more is not very helpful. But supporting people, listening, there's a, the, a, um, a beautiful thing you can say to someone you work with or someone who's in your family, your partner, which is tell me more. Like just listen to what people need around you because they will tell you. I have my When my daughter was a teenager, um, I, I always try to have friends and mentors that are um, at different ages than I am, you know, ideally 10, 20 years older than me. So they can tell me what the preview for coming attractions (laughs) is. And, and my friend, Donna Constantinople, who is 10 years older than I am, has always given me these incredible pieces of wisdom. 
and I was saying, oh, well, you know, it's kind of getting to that time when Alexandra is going to start act- asking about sex and, and, you know, there's little things starting to happen in school and I'm kind of worried and, you know, and, and I'm just not sure how to answer her questions. And, and Donna just started laughing to a smile on face. She said, why don't you just ask her and then listen to what she tells you? And it's so simple. Sometimes we get a whole thing going in our head when we just need to ask our, our colleague, you know, like, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything you want to talk about? Is there anything you want to tell me? Is there anything I can support you with? The simplicity of just being a common sense human being sometimes is the biggest thing that we miss. We're thinking about, oh, do they want help on the project? Do, do they need this? Do they, you know, we, we guess, but we, we don't have to guess. You know, generally, if we're thoughtful, empathetic, and have a good, um, if we really, truly are listening, you know, there's fake listening when you listen because you're just waiting to say the thing you're going to say, which is the most irritating thing that people do in meetings and in relationships and in life. Is, uh, but when you really listen because you're trying to hear the person, then you think about what you're going to say. Then you off, uh, offer a response authentically. That's when people feel authentically supported and authentically on your team. And, and I, I think I, I learned this not only from personal life, but also when we've worked with girls. No one had ever, whenever I, we sat with girls and personally in the very early years back in 2005, when I was first um, creating the work with the team, um, we would just sit and talk to girls. And the first thing that girls would say or, or you know, would be, no one's ever asked us anything. <laughs> no one ever wanted to know what we thought and what we felt and what we were dreaming, what, what our dreams were, what our challenges were. So there's nothing more powerful than a great listener. Yeah, I, I, well, as a, a mom of three kids, I, I've come to learn that quite a bit too. Especially my 11 year old, and now I know I can go to you for advice. Uh, is, <laughs> is we do tend to, you know, approach it with, um, I don't want to say judgment, but you know, our our viewpoint versus pausing and asking them, you know, what's going on? What do you need? How do you see this situation? And, you know, to your point, that extends beyond us as as leaders of our families, but into leaders of our companies, leaders of our communities, uh, how mm. we, we really show up for others. And it starts with that listening um, and, and making sure, you know, we have the sleep and the food and the exercise to give us that energy to have that maximum impact. Uh, so thank you for all of that. I, I'm i curious, I mean, given all that's happened, particularly in the past year, what is the greatest urgency right now uh, for, for girls and where we should focus? You're doing uh, great work with Girl Effect, um, which is an in, independent nonprofit organization really focused on girls and being able to, to lift them out of poverty and and give them access to so many of the things you talked about, education and reproductive health. But where do where should we be focusing our energy? And is it one thing? Is that too narrowly defined of a question? Well, you know, girls are the uh, sort of the first to suffer and the last to benefit. And so most importantly, we need to keep them front of mind as we look at these issues. For instance, with COVID, there's 47 million women who are losing access to, to contraceptives. And we in and in developing and emerging economies, those are often girls turning into women. And it's absolutely critical. When girls experience uh, pregnancy, it is a irreversible event in their lives. It is to state the obvious. If they get married before they were ready because of economic hardship coming from COVID. Uh, dropping out of school. These things become irreversible events for girls. 20 million girls may never return to school because of COVID, according to a Malala Fund estimate. And so these are devastating numbers. And so we do need to focus on um, continuing to find the resources girls that need, get them to them. Often girls just don't know that the resources are there. And that's a lot of the work of the girl effect. And Jess Posner Odede and the team are extraordinary team. I chair the board of the organization and she and the team have doubled and tripled and quadrupled down on their efforts to reach and communicate with girls, let them know where they can get those resources, how to get those resources. And 
to let them know that we're there for them um, because loneliness and isolation is profound. Many girls already suffered from a, a lot of loneliness and isolation, and this is just a, a more difficult time. The home, uh, one of the most devastating things I learned about girls in the early days of, of my work is that many girls, for, for so many girls, home is not safe. School is not safe. And so as we've learned from so many, uh, so much news around um, uh, harassment and, and exploitation and violence. Um, so um, keeping girls front of mind, making sure resources are going there, holding the organizations we know of and governments accountable to uh, continuing to reach girls and then supporting organizations like the Girl Effect that do incredibly important work to support those girls. Maria, I want to ask you kind of a, an open-ended question so you can take it where you want to. But you had posted a, a comment on LinkedIn uh, that really resonated with me. You said, no matter how today turns out, life will go on and you'll be okay. If my career has taught me anything. It is that systemic change is grueling and slow. Change is about more than an election. It's about the small gestures that add up. You had written a piece about participatory democracy and and just the power of that single step forward. And you mentioned earlier in our conversation, this step, you know, taking the step forwards in your career and in life. But as many of us, I think, are looking to the future, uh, this has been, you know, a hard, difficult year. Um, And you, Maria, have your hands in so many important areas, looking at, you know, how businesses progress and their impact. You're looking at impact on on girls. Um, You've been involved in a number of of causes um, from Time's Up and the Commission on Sexual Harassment and Advancing Equality. You sit sit on boards tied to fundraising, GoFundMe, and beyond. I mean, you you have a unique perspective looking across the spectrum of so many aspects of business and society. And I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts on where we go from here? What's what's making you hopeful? What's getting you excited uh, for the next phase? Yeah, um, I love the question. Um, when things are messed up is where opportunity lies. People don't really like to change. Organizations have momentum and don't like to change. They're, they're an organism. Very, the system, the economic system we live in, the political system we live in, this, the social norms that we all live under, what's okay, what's not okay, those are very slow to change unless something disrupts them. And so the negative of today is, wow, it's hard to be the people in the middle of the eye of the storm of a big moment in history. But we are those people. This is our our unique moment in history where things are pretty darn messed up. Uh, COVID has literally stopped the world in a way. I remember used to, at times in my career, especially when I was a mom and I was trying to balance work and I'd just be like, could the world just stop for a minute? I just got to catch up. So there, there's this bizarreness to this moment that we probably don't even realize and we won't truly see till we're five, 10 years out of it. But Within that chaos, within that mess, people's minds open to different possibilities. And before, you know, that you would wear a mask, that was like, you know, every once in a while you'd see someone wearing a mask. That's, you know, they must be paranoid about getting a cold or something. Uh, That social norm has shifted. So there is opportunity in this, but it's really hard to see because when you're the generation that is in the storm, you don't see that you are setting the bricks, the, the, the pathway for the next chapter of history, but we really are. So it, it, it's important to stay away from a psychology of scarcity and try to be as much as you can in a psychology of abundance. So if you think I can't do anything, I can't go outside. I, you know, I I can't um, get together with friends the way I would, that's all the negative, like can't, 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 can't. Um, instead of what's the psychology of abundance of what can I do? Well, I can deepen the relationships of those. Everyone says I'm close. Either their relationship broke up, uh, their, their partnership broke up, or they've deepened their relationship. So there is something different happening for young people. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm tearing up because I feel what you're saying so deeply. And y- y- there's, you know, there's great 
power in that intentionality of being able to, um, yeah, being able to direct our lives, you know, post this time. And, you know, I think about how I, in my career, had kind of slipped into this traveling all the time, going to events at, at night, just, you know, just unintended, just unintentionally without thought just started, you know, okay, I need to do this. I'm going to do it. I need to do this. I'm going to do it. And now having, you know, 365 plus days where I'm home with my kids every night has completely changed things. And I won't go back to that way I was before because I've seen how much I enjoy this. So it, I, I thank you for those words because as you know, there, there's much um, hardship and there's much that um, has caused grief and sadness and frustration. But in your words, I see hope and hope for the future and where we can take this. And I I think we all need a little hope right now. So thank you, Maria. I'm going to pivot a little bit of our conversation where we're getting towards the end, and I know our community loves to learn a little bit more about the the guest on a personal level. So I'm going to ask you some questions. I would love for you to answer just in a few words or less. What um, sure. are you an introvert or an extrovert? On the test, I scored super introvert, but I'm what's called a skilled extrovert because my career in my life has made me be extroverted. So I'm a skilled introvert. I, I I love, this is actually my favorite question because I hear such varied responses and they all make <laughs> sense. It shows it's just such a spectrum of, of how we engage with others. And that's, that feels very human to me. What is your yeah. favorite day of the week? Easy Sunday morning. I love Sunday morning because the world is quiet and it's like, you get this little pause to catch up and look around and and notice things around you. It's delicious. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Early bird all the way. I'm useless in, at night. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to take on anything difficult at night, only in the morning for me. <laughs> Who would be your dream dinner guest? Oh, um, probably Margaret Atwood right now. I just, you know, she's such an incredible writer and I, I just like to ask her about like, where does, where do those ideas come from? How does she pull them together? Had means tail. And oh, it's just, I'm just enthralled by her writing. So Maria, side story, I have to tell you, I am, um, I went to Villanova university. I was an English major there and I had the great oh. honor of being invited back uh, by one of my professors to speak with um, the students today and talk about careers and The professor who invited me was my senior thesis professor, Dr. Hicks, and I did my senior thesis on The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, you're kidding. You know, and it was just- Oh my God, that must be fascinating. It must have been so fascinating. I I loved it. I I told uh, Dr. Hicks, because, you know, we we did a lot of courses on, you know, science fiction and gender and um, just, it, it opened my mind, I think, to such different narratives and perspectives that helped to shape me where I am today. And, you know, back to what you said earlier in the conversation about careers and it was just all these influences that I think, you know, set us off on these journeys and, but it's, you know, one step after the next and where does that take us? And Dr. Hicks certainly had that impact. That's amazing. I love it. What, uh, do you have any pet peeves? Yes arrogance people who think they know everything and have the answer always has been what has been your favorite recent read oh um i'm reading ted chang's stories of our lives it's sci-fi uh he's the he wrote the uh arrivals that movie arrivals Mm -hmm. and he does these short stories these sci-fi short stories i love sci-fi short stories and so he he's my current current um author crush. I'm sensing you and I have very similar uh, literary tastes. So I'm going to have to start Sounds like following it. all of your, all of your reading. <laughs> what is Me your too. top self-care practice? Sleep, eat, exercise, the magic trio. Magic trio. And I need to master the sleep part, but uh, I'm yeah, very that's a tough one. Sleep. I'm just not good at it. 
Yeah, read Why We Sleep. That's a good book. He's done a good job of like, it's really convincing. I read that book and I was like, okay, I'm really going to take this seriously. How would you, this is a bigger question, but one that I, I'm curious, um, how would you define your legacy or what, what do you want your legacy to be? Wow. Okay. That's a very big question. I guess I'd like my legacy to be that I've left behind things that flower long after I'm gone. Um, maybe that's why people put flowers on graves. You know, there's, there's something about knowing that your child is well equipped for the world or the organization that you started or the organization that you work for, the, the things that you started carry on beyond you. Um, and, and so probably the, the work that I've done with adolescent girls, getting girls on the global agenda, it was a fight and, and it was hard and, you know, everybody was patronizing about it. And um, it was so hard to keep the focus on girls and not have it immediately go to women and people understanding that girls are a unique population, that there's, that an adolescent girl is different and she needs different things. So I hope that no one ever, ever forgets that girls need very special um, attention and special resources. They are the mother of every child that will be born on this planet and we need to treat them very carefully. Uh, and we need them to succeed and thrive, not just be, not just make it, but to thrive, because then the, the whole world thrives. So that would, that would just make me very happy um, if that was, uh, if I had a small part in that legacy. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your words, your insights, your inspiration, and for joining us here today on the Elevate Podcast. Thanks so much for listening to Elevate. If you like what you hear, help a girl out. Subscribe to the Elevate podcast on iTunes. Give us five stars and share your review. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK. That's Elevate Network. And become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com that's e-l-l-e-v-a-t-e network.com and special thanks to our producer Catherine Heller she rocks and to our voiceover artist Rachel Griesinger thanks so much and join us next week On Deloitte's OnCloud podcast, my co-host Mike Cavus and I talk with innovation leaders to explore how they use cloud engineering for new possibilities for their organizations. Join myself, David Linthicum, by subscribing to OnCloud wherever you get your podcasts.